First, let's, uh, let, let's get to know the band. Introduce yourself. Derry only, bass. Yeah. Blim Whitman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doyle guitar. Yeah. Tell us, where are the Misfits main and What are you guys trying to do? Well, I don't know. Misfits have such a strange legacy, don't they? They're a band who struggled to get any kind of momentum going, a band who rarely left the tri-state area in their classic years, and a band who initially couldn't even get their debut album released, to becoming one of the most iconic bands of all time thanks to their image, aesthetics, t-shirts, legend, their catalog of classic tracks, and a few choice covers by the likes of Guns N' Roses and Metallica. The band's original lineup can play arenas and stadiums the world over, and for a band who never even had an album go gold, or even tinfoil for that fact, and a band who never even sniffed the charts until the 90s is amazing. Sure, it's easy to write them off by saying it's all thanks to a logo and iconography, but people aren't paying hand over fist for all these shows just to see a logo flash up on screen. They're paying these ridiculous prices they're charging to see these songs be played by most of the guys who originally wrote and recorded them. The guys who likely influenced a lot of your favorite bands. The original Misfits became a legend, a spooky mashup of the Ramones, the Munsters, and Grindhouse Horror. And they had Glenn Danzig, the guy from Guitar Hero. They birthed horror punk, less of a genre and more of a style, a slightly different flavor of punk. I mean, instrumentally, most horror punk bands aren't too different from their non-horror contemporaries. Lyrical subject matter doesn't really dictate genre. Christian metal isn't a genre, and neither is horror punk. Deal with it. But the tidal waves the Misfits started from their early sound, which can most easily be described as Elvis on Crystal Meth, to Rock Horror Picture Show with more distortion, to Straight Edge, Bella Lugosi Core, to Dare I Say It's the Graves and Jerry Only on Vocals Era. We're gonna discuss all of it, and you're gonna enjoy it. At the very least, you'll enjoy it more than I will. So let's attend to some horror business and go through the discography and history of one of the finest bands to ever walk among us. This is the Misfits Retrospective. This one's for you, Jimbo. <laughs> the band was formed in Lodi, New Jersey by frontman and first keyboardist Glenn Anzalone, later Glenn Danzig in either late 76 or early 1977. I find conflicting reports, but I'm pretty sure it was 77. Glenn put together the band because of his quote, hatred of everything. He hated what rock music had become, he hated the corporate rock of Journey, Styx, and Boston, and he wanted to rebel by forming his own band with his own macabre interests in mind, including, but not limited to, horror films and uh, Elvis. He shacked up with drummer Manny Martinez and bassist, not Jerry only yet, but a woman named Diane Di Piazza and guitarist named Jimmy Battle, who wasn't to last. Forgive me if I'm getting any of this information wrong, but information of the Misfits pre-only is very scarce. Glenn got the name The Misfits from the feature film of the same name released in 1961, a western that is most notable for being Marilyn Monroe's final acting credit before sadly passing away. He said he picked the name because of how much of an outcast and misfit he felt like at the time. Manny introduced Glenn to Jerry Kayafa, I believe is pronounced and would a short time later be rechristened as Jerry Only, after his name was misspelt on their first 7-inch leading to him wanting to be credited as Jerry, only Jerry. And the name kind of stuck from there. He joined the band only a month after receiving a bass as a late Christmas present, and as I'm sure you're all aware, Jerry would be by far the longest serving member of the band appearing on every record and show. I've seen some get mad at this because he's not even an original member, man. Which, yes, is correct in the most technical of terms, which makes this poster kind of false advertising. But Diane Di Piazza was only in the band for a matter of weeks, long before the band became the Misfits as we know them today. And Jerry was instrumental in molding the band's style. He created the iconic devil lock hairstyle, and he along with his brother Doyle made a lot of the props and customized the guitars for stage use, helped finance the band by working in their family's machine shop, 
and even though Glenn wrote all the songs, Jerry and Doyle would help with arrangements and stuff like that, and apparently wrote a small portion of the riffs, if Jerry's to be believed. So I think calling Jerry an original member is honestly a fair statement, if not completely true. Unless we forget, Jerry is one of the best bass tones in all of punk rock, despite not being an amazing player himself. Less than a month of rehearsals later, the Misfits played their first ever show as a three-piece in April of 1977 at the legendary CBGB's at four in the morning to quote a handful of our friends and a bunch of drunks. In summer of 77, they went into the Rainbow Studio in New York City and these sessions yielded the song Cough, Cool, and She. Other songs were apparently recorded, but only those two were ever released, unfortunately. The Cough Cool single is a really odd listen, and the best way I can describe it is spooky doors with some jazzy inflections from the drums and bass. It's a fascinating nugget of punk history. The recording quality is ass, but it adds to the allure of these songs. They're like some oddity record you find in your grandma's attic. Cough, Cool, and She would later be re-recorded and added to later releases, sounding more stereotypical misfits. She would find its way onto the full version of Static Age and Legacy Brutality, and while I love both versions, I prefer the original. Jerry's bass line is more prominent, and I think Glenn's vocal performance is just a tad bit better. <laughs> It's another version of Cough Cool appeared on Collection 2, and it sounds more Sam Hain than Misfits. And it's only Glenn as he used a drum machine and re-recorded everything else himself, and added guitar. We'll talk more of this later. After seeing bands like the Ramones and Blondie get attention, Jerry and Glenn realized that they probably needed a guitar player, and should ditch the keys. They recruited Frank Licata, later given the name Franche Coma, and the Misfits adopted a more stereotypical punk sound. A short time later, Manny Martinez was given the boot for his unreliability, and Jim Catania, or Mr. Jim as he was credited, took his place. And with this lineup, they recorded their very first album that laid unreleased for nearly two decades. Static Age uh, was, in a lot of ways, uh, pretty groundbreaking. Uh, it was something that uh, people didn't, well, uh, now people get it, but back then nobody understood. We took it to Sire Records, who was doing the Ramones. We took it to Chrysalis, who was doing Generation X and Blondie, and they didn't get it. And, and it's great that all the stuff that I've done has lived on, and um, it's got a life of its own. It's great. Especially since all the labels back then said, you guys are terrible, you suck, you'll never make it. And I'm like, oh, I disagree, but you know. I guess it makes sense for such a strange band like the Misfits to start a video like this with something that technically isn't their debut. Months after Cough Cool was released, Mercury Records released the debut Perry Ubu album, The Modern Dance on their own Blank Records imprint, not aware that the Blank Records name was already trademarked and was being used by Glenn. So in exchange for the name, Mercury were able to give the Misfits 30 hours of studio time at CI Studios in New York City, and if the label liked what they heard, then they would release the resulting LP. So in early 1978, the band recorded 17 tracks, though due to time constraints, we're only able to mix about 14 of them. Mercury along with every other label passed on the album, and the band would eventually release most of the songs through singles, EPs, and compilation albums. But the album itself was a holy grail of punk lost media for many years, until the mid-90s when Jerry was able to get the rights to these recordings from Danzig. The original 14 songs are already mixed were included on the Misfits box set in 1996, but in 1997, the entire session of 17 songs were mixed and remastered for the sake of consistency, and released on Caroline Records. Fun fact, minor threat guitarist Lyle Pressler, who would briefly be a member of Danzig's post-Misfits band, Sam Hain, who at the time worked at Caroline Records, and producer Tom... Tom, actually had to bake the original tapes in an oven to preserve it just a little bit longer since it was almost completely destroyed, and it completely disintegrated as soon as it ran through the remastering equipment and onto a hard drive. There's some alternate versions of Bullet and Spinal Remains still missing, but considering we were this close to losing one of the most important releases in all punk rock, 
I think will live despite the loss of those tracks. And it's such a shame that it was never picked up by anyone when the band originally shopped this record around in 78. This album reads like your greatest hits. So many classic tracks. And it's honestly my all time favorite Misfits release. The fact that every label said no to releasing a song as iconic as Last Caress is mind boggling. Sure, it's edgy, but Rampant Infantside has never been this catchy. It deserves all the accolades it has received, and as much as I love the Metallica version, their cover was the first time I ever heard the song, you just can't beat the original Misfits concoction. Static Age is kind of hard to classify. It was before the band were balls deep in the horror image and aesthetic, though there's some horror elements in these songs. But I won't be so quick to call it traditional punk since it's a bit more ferocious and there's some odd soundscapes to be found in some tracks. Wikipedia calls it hardcore punk, but I'll just chalk that up to Wikipedia being Wikipedia. The best way I can describe it is really aggressive post-punk. Without pronounced the basses, it's even louder than the guitar. It's kind of like a heavier Joy Division with a much better singer and a really big interest in the macabre and frankly disgusting. I could easily see Ian Curtis take a crack at some songs like Come Back. What Chase did not like as much due to it being long and slow and it went for a gloomy mood and vibe instead of giving the listener a hook to latch onto. But after growing up a bit and becoming acquainted with Sam Hain's outputs, I view this song as a precursor to a lot of what Glenn did later. The lyrics deal with longing and grief, it's easy to view it as a breakup song, and there may be some truth to it, but with the mentions of the raven and the gloomy nature of the song, I can't help but draw conclusions to this story, The Raven, by Edgar Allan Poe, one of Glenn's all-time favorite authors. And with the metaphors the song deals with, it can be applicable for so many things in life relating to the loss of someone or something. I also like the subtle bass lines where Jerry really gives it his all, and it's all the more impressive when you remember the fact that he'd only been playing for like 10 months total when this album was recorded. I wish Jerry kept improving throughout his career because after Static Age, he had a bad habit of just boringly playing the root note ad nauseum, but he used to be way more adventurous. <laughs> Some fans may be surprised to find that the horror elements that the Misfits are synonymous with aren't very abundant in this album compared to later records. Sure, there's a lot of edginess and darkness in this album's subject matter, but that's mainly due to Glenn's interests. He loves horror and the macabre, and that's always been his go-to when it comes to writing lyrics. And even songs like Last Caress, with its mentions of rape and murder, and Bullet, a song gruesomely about the assassination of JFK, yes, they're very disturbing, but it's more irreverence than horror. I think it shares more with songs like John Wayne Was a Nazi by MDC than a song like Halloween 2, for instance. I mean, Bullet has this line. That isn't scary. That's just fucking hilarious. But there's a handful of songs about scary stuff. Teenagers from Mars was almost a single and was likely written about the film Teenagers from Outer Space or Invaders from Mars. TV Casualty is about being a complete slob with square eyes glued to the television and its effect it can have on you. But the most horror this album gets is Return of the Fly, unmistakably about the film starring... It's funny that Glenn made the song specifically about the less remembered sequel instead of the original classic everybody remembers. Or remembered until David Cronenberg pulled a John Carpenter and made his remake the definitive version for many. I imagine he did it so the hook would work better phonetically, I also love the ringing guitar strings in the verses and how Jerry moves between the roots with a simple but effective fill. This song is the blueprint for much of the Misfits material to come later, and I love it. We also have the infectious stomp of We Are 138 before it blasts off into a blistering sci-fi scorcher about the film THX 1138, according to Jerry and later guitarist Bobby Steele. But Glenn later said, they didn't write it, they don't know what it's about, it's about violence. Okay, Glenn. It also has this hilarious two-note guitar solo, I love it. 
Now my favorite off the record and my favorite misfit song period is Hybrid Moments. It's one of the more personal songs Glenn ever wrote in the Misfits. Some have said that it's about the film Alien, which might make sense at first, but this song was recorded in January 1978 and was likely written much earlier. And the first Alien came out in 79, so I'm not sure about that. I believe the creature's rape your face line is metaphorical. I think the song is more about how people will withhold their emotions for whatever reason, and never let their feelings out, and if they do, it's in short bursts. The opening line says it all. If you're gonna scream, scream with me. Moments like this never last. And it's true. We've all been in situations with people we care about letting our guards down and acting like goofballs because it's fun. And it can be a great bonding experience. It's one of few, and when I say few, I mean very few, feel-good songs Glenn ever wrote. Now that I think about it, it might be the only one. Glenn isn't exactly the happiest guy most of the time. I love his joyous performance, his longing croon, and to die for melodies. They work so well against the cacophonic walls of power chords and root notes behind him. It's simply put, 1 minute and 42 seconds of pure bliss. <laughs> And it ends so well with In the Doorway, a track that features a very human look at Glenn Danzig before he would hide himself behind all the blood and theatrics later on. There's a lot of angst in this song, but he was a young man still. Of course there's some angst. And that's Static Age, still my favorite Misfits album, and it's such a unique listen. And it's one we almost didn't get, not only due to it being scrapped for many years, but if they couldn't form a deal with Mercury for the professional recording time, these songs likely would have eventually been recorded in a shoddy manner like Cough Cool or something. And if they were recorded at all, with their eventual horror makeover, it's likely that a song like Hybrid Moments would have eventually been just shelved. And that would have been such a shame. And even though it wasn't released in its entirety until the 90s, it still serves as a landmark for both the Misfits and punk rock as a whole. The band soon after fully adopted the horror look, with skulls and the all black attire. They changed their logo using the famous monsters typeface from those old magazines, and they adopted the Crimson Ghost as their logo, a figure of old serials and films back in the 50s and 60s. It's still weird how they were able to co-opt these logos and fonts for themselves. The Misfits still own the copyright for their logos, even though they were clearly stolen. But neither owners of the original copyrighted material ever went after them, and since it's been so long, I don't think they ever can now. But I guess it doesn't matter since they look so cool. Jerry invented the classic devil lock hairstyle, which was an end result of him not cutting his hair and combing it over his face into a long tail of hair. Jerry's brother Doyle would later sport a devil lock, much like his brother, and Danzig's devil lock was more influenced by Eddie Munster. Also, by the way, it's gonna take a little while before we get to the next album because there's a lot of singles, EPs, and general history, so by all means, skip here if you want to go straight to Walk Among Us. The band released a bullet single on their new label, Plan 9, named after the film, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Franche Coma left the band due to his dislike of touring, so Rick Rowley of the band The Victims played in his place for like a month-long tour of Detroit and Canada. And fun fact, The Victims were the only non-Glan Danzig band ever to be released on Plan 9 Records. Mr. Jim left the band because he didn't like the band's newfound horror image, and was replaced by Joey Poole, later renamed Joey Image and Bobby Steele joined as the permanent replacement for Franche Coma. They went back to CI Studios with the same engineer and producer that they had for Static Age, Dave Achilles, and they recorded a handful of songs that would make their way onto the Beware EP with some Static Age cuts, and the horror business single A-Side and B-Side. The title track is an infectious number rumored to be about the killing of Nancy Spungen, the girlfriend of Sex Pistols bassist Sid Vicious a killing which Sid is more than likely responsible for. Though it's likely it's just about the film Psycho. That film also had someone die in a bathroom, much like what happened to Nancy. And fun fact, Jerry's with Sid the night he died, made him his last meal, helped Sid's mother spread the guy's ashes over Nancy's grave, and at one point the Misfits were gonna be Sid's backing band for his solo career, which would have been really odd. You don't go in the bathroom The 
The band recorded three songs for the Night of the Living Dead single, the A side would later be on Walk Among Us, but one of the B sides, Where Eagles Dare, is one of my all time favorite Misfits songs with one of the best hooks in all of punk rock. Also around this time, Bobby Steele got too drunk in the mud club in New York City and puked all over John Lennon's feet. I just think that's funny. The band opened for the Dams at the Hurrah Club, and before the show, Jerry talks to Dams frontman Dave Vanian about supporting them for a tour in the UK. So the band did what they could to get ready for the UK tour, though Jerry's dad funded the trip, only to show up to Dave Vanian's house to be met with a resounding... Oh, you guys are serious? The Dam did what they could. They added them to the bill of the tour they were doing, got them some gear to use, but after their first show, they walked from the tour because they said they weren't getting paid enough and the instruments they were given were pretty bad. Which, yeah, that's kind of lame with the Damned, mainly their management. But you'd think they would have gotten a contract set up before showing up unannounced? I don't see how that couldn't have ended poorly. They had some time to kill before they had to head back to the States. During this time, they almost opened for The Clash. Jerry went sightseeing in London. Joey Image was having drug withdrawals. And Bobby and Glenn went to see the jam at the Rainbow, got into a fight with a bunch of skinheads, and were then arrested spent two nights in Brixton Jail where Glenn wrote London Dungeon, which would later appear on the Three Hits from Hell EP. It's such a spooky song with a demented riff and tons of atmosphere. One of the best Misfits cuts. Jerry left the band after returning to the US, unhappy with how their tour turned out, and he would sadly pass away two years ago in 2020. Rest in peace. A few months later, he was replaced by Arthur Googie. The band went into MSP Studios to record what would be their first LP, 12 Hits From Hell, though the sessions didn't go as well as they might have hoped. Bobby was barely showing up, and Paul Kayafa, who would later be rechristened as Doyle Wolfgang von Frankenstein, Jerry's brother was already rehearsing with the band whenever Bobby flicked, and during these sessions, Bobby just didn't come in and told Glenn, just have Doyle play my guitar. This infuriated Glenn, and they decided to fire Bobby and have Doyle just outright replace him. But the album never released. Three of the songs made its way into the three hits from Hell EP I mentioned before, remixed, and the two versions of Halloween were on the Halloween single, and many of the songs would be on Walk Among Us. I promise we're almost there. The MSP sessions for the album showed up in the Misfits box set, and Caroline Records almost released the whole 12 Hits From Hell album in 2001 with a new mix with both Doyle and Bobby's guitars in the mix at about an equal level. But Jerry and Glenn put a kibosh on that for hypocritical reasons, which I definitely think is lame. I much prefer the 2001 remixes compared to the versions on the box set. And the original versions of Where Your Goes Dare, Night of the Living Dead, Skulls, and Astro Zombies are arguably better than most of the versions most people know. Thankfully, there's bootlegs you can find of the record, so you don't need to be asterisked by eBay in order to experience it. But then again, if 12 Hits did release, at least when it was originally supposed to, then we probably would have never have gotten the most quintessential Misfits album, Walk Among Us. Only 4,000 words in, but we finally got into the first real album. <laughs> Fuck. I think one of the reasons <laughs> really? record companies are scared of punk, like real punk, hardcore punk, is because that it poses a, a threat to their authority over the bands and controlling the bands. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Definitely. If they're worried about controlling the Clash, at least that's what the Clash said in their interviews on ABC, uh, that the record companies are trying to control them. Could you imagine the kind of control they'd try and, you know, exert over a band like us or Black Flag or someone? So I think that's basically the, the only drawback for punk. Because like a lot of people have said, it's really close to heavy metal. You know, it's just the words and maybe the, the violence that goes along with it. That's not really close to heavy metal. Now if you're looking for the quintessential Misfits album, or jumping on points for the band, then look no further than Walk Among Us. At least on Slash Records, Imprint, Ruby Records, it may not be my favorite, like I said that Honor belongs to Static Age, but a Static Age was the Misfits in a very primal state, before they worked out their sound and image, and it wasn't as accessible. But Walk Among Us is the Misfits' mission statement, a cacophonic barrage of powerpunk riffs, evil Elvis vocals that will leave the king himself red-faced, 
and a lush, rich atmosphere in many tracks. It sounds like what you'd hear walking into one of those haunted mansion attractions, but the cheesy guys in costumes you see trying to scare you are actual ghouls who just want to hang. People may call the Misfits horror punk, but not much of this album is scarier than an episode of Scooby-Doo. And I don't mean that as an insult, it's such a fun time. Walk Among Us is the album equivalent of putting on the best B-movie you've ever seen with your friends with a case of beer and snacks. It's such a fun party album. I Turned Into a Martian reads like a classic body horror flick that unfortunately doesn't exist. Glenn likely ripped the title from an old Marvel comic, which is funny considering Glenn's open disdain he has, at least nowadays, from Marvel, DC, and mainstream comics. The classic Misfits or Danzig woes are in full effect and has never been as catchy or as well implemented. A lot of people will meme Glenn for his overabundance of woes and yells and yelps or what have you, but damn, in his day he could put so much character into a woe. With no words at all, you somehow understood exactly what he meant every time. Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight is surprisingly enough a live version recorded at the Ritz, but it fits in well considering how notoriously sloppy the band were live in those days. But they played well. You even hear a little bit of London Dungeon at the end, but not the whole song, which is kind of a shame because, you know, that song rules. But it probably won't fit too well in this record, so I guess I get it. Night of the Living Dead, I'm convinced, is just 90% woes and incomprehensible yelling, but I love it regardless. Funnily enough, it isn't specifically about the film, but zombies in general, which is still cool. Vampira has this really cool droning, dissonant thing going on. The lyrics about Vampira, and also Plan 9 from Outer Space, and the band had such affection for this film that they not only named their label after it, but on one occasion they screened it before a performance once instead of having an opening band. Nike Agogo has this killer groove with the drums and minimal guitar and bass during the verses. It takes its name not from the shoes, but from the goddess in Greek mythology and the Nike missiles used during the Cold War. But in the song they use metaphors to make it about a girl who'll make you explode. A song that in my opinion is likely too catchy for its own good is Skulls. The hook is so hypnotizing and it draws you in with a trance. It's one of few Misfit songs where you clearly understand Glenn's lyrics as he is properly singing intelligibly for once. He's singing lustfully for your skulls without even a little bit of irony. And I love it. The blood drains down like devil's rain, we'll bathe tonight. All Hell Breaks Loose is ferocious and sounds like something that could easily be on Earth AD. Devil's Whorehouse is this churning riff, Glenn sounds like a mad conductor, and it has this weird percussion thing going on in the left channel throughout the song. It's odd, and as soon as you notice it, you can't unnotice it. Kind of like the Bongo Man in September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Maybe I'm just an idiot who never noticed, but... eh. Heat Breeders is a pounding track that'll make your heart skip a beat during that lovely pre-chorus, and much like with BR-138, it has a quite frankly fucking hilarious tuna guitar solo. But my oh my, Astro Zombies is probably the crown jewel of this album. I think if this song was released as a single, and if they made a video for this song like they did for Brain Eaters, then maybe it could have become the band's de facto song, instead of Die Die My Darling The Last Caress. It's anthemic, and I can imagine it soundtracking the most cheesetastic B movie you've ever seen, even though they already cribbed the name from another movie. Glenn's caked and reverb vocals ring through your speakers, the riffs sound triumphant, and there's even some cool little things going on in the background that's easy to miss. But they make the song even better. There's a ton of overdubbed guitar and vocals, it's produced so well, and damn, I just can't get over how good it is. I mean, this could have easily been a big song for them. Walk Among Us is an absolute masterpiece and defines the band. I may like Static Age more personally, but they weren't as focused on that album and it doesn't flow as well as Walk Among Us. Not even close. You can tell the band gave this album a lot of love and attention, just to make a statement and goddamn people listened. The production was fantastic, the songs were amazing, and it influenced a ton of bands in its wake. 
Sure, Brain Eaters is a little basic, and it's by far my least favorite, but it helps the album feel like a party. You can't have a bad time when listening to that song. This album is an absolute masterpiece, and you could totally see why it's so many people's favorite. After Walk Among Us, the band released the live EP, Evil Live, which later in 1987 was released as an LP with more songs. Though unfortunately, the band wasn't to last for much longer. Glenn was growing dissatisfied with Jerry and Doyle's stagnation at their instruments and their lack of time to practice due to them working at their dad's machine shop. And he's said that if they both practiced more, then the Misfits likely would have never broken up, as he wants to go into a more metal direction rather than stay in the punk thing that they had been limited to due to Jerry and Doyle's lack of prowess at their instruments. And on top of that, they're going through a bunch of problems with drummers. I mean, it was just a hot mess. Danzig felt like he was being held back by being in the Misfits. By this point, he had already released a solo single, Who Killed Marilyn, so you could tell not all was well in Misfits Land. And after a Halloween show in Detroit in 1983, which by many counts was a disaster, their drummer, Brain Damage, was too drunk to play and was escorted off by Doyle. In a Darth Vader manner. And Todd Swalla from the Necros finished their set. Glenn announced it would be the band's last show, but two months later, Plan 9 released what was thought to be the final Misfits album, made up of material that they had recorded before the band had broken up. What about your record coming out? What about it? <laughs> well, tell these people about it. People out there want to know about your record. Well, we got a new album coming out called Earth AD. Now, you don't like Earth, D, Earth AD, correct? I don't like Earth AD. Huh? And why is that? I just think there's a lot more going on there that no one ever got to hear. The way I like to do records, I like to add stuff in there and give them all layers and textures and stuff. It could have still had their wall of noise stuff, but I would have liked to added some more stuff in there. And also my vocals, I don't like I don't like the way Spot records, per, you know, for my taste. And I don't like the way he records vocals at all. My vocals are too thin and they're kind of buried in everything. I don't like it. Now, Earth AD is a transitionary album. Not so much for the Misfits, but more Glenn Danzig as an artist. At the start of the Misfits' career, Punk had only just started, and the Misfits' sound was rooted in the artists of the 60s and 50s. But by 1983, Punk had changed, and many bands were evolving into a faster and even more aggressive direction thanks to bands like Minor Threat, Black Flag, and The Germs. It was called Hardcore Punk or as most would call it, simply hardcore. At this time, Glenn was hanging out with Henry Rollins, so it makes sense why the hardcore sound might have rubbed off on him. It also makes sense that it would be the last Misfits album before Glenn went to more metal direction with his later bands. In fact, there were two songs on this album that Glenn originally wrote for what would become his new band, Samhain, Blood Feast and Death Comes Ripping. Apparently, Glenn used these songs for the Misfits as a last-ditch effort to keep the band together, or they probably just needed more songs to make this an LP and not an EP, let's be real here. Blood Feast has these spooky-sounding backing vocals that sound super eerie and like something out of The Exorcist, and Death Comes Ripping is a blistering song that hits you with pounding riff after pounding riff. Doyle is playing his guitar like a jackhammer and has this funny little attempt at a solo in the last chorus with a whopping one note being played ad nauseum, but still, the song is amazing. Part of the reason why the Misfits were able to so easily acclimate themselves to the hardcore sound so well was the inclusion of Robo into the band at the suggestion of Henry Rollins, who played with him in Black Flag. Arthur Googie was kicked out during the Walk Among Us tour, apparently in a McDonald's because he wanted another cheeseburger, but the band didn't have the money and after an argument, he was kicked out. Though Doyle has denied this ever happening. I don't know why he left the band, but they did have a fight over a cheeseburger. And it's kind of shame because Googie is probably my favorite Misfits drummer. He had the right amount of tenacity in his playing without letting the songs be lost because he's going too hard like Robo would sometimes. Don't get me wrong, I love Robo, I just don't think he was too great when playing the more melodic numbers from this band. And Jerry said that Googie was super dedicated to the band and he lived in Queens, worked full time in construction, and still traveled daily to New Jersey to practice. But he fortunately plays on one song of this album, and what a song, Die Die My Darling. It was recorded during the Walk Among Us sessions, but for whatever reason, it was never included on the record. And despite it not originally being for this album, it still fits incredibly well as a part of Earth AD. It's another one of the Misfits' really well-known songs, thanks to it being covered by Metallica on their Garage Inc. album. 
It has this infectious stomp course and it just has too many hooks to count. It also has this weird background noise almost buried in the mix, but it's there and kind of hard to miss once you notice it. <laughs> Glenn is famously not a big fan of this album. He said he didn't like Spot's production, the lack of overdubs and texturing, and how thin he thought his vocals sounded. And I can understand that. I remember not liking this album at all when I first heard it when I was like 13. My baby ears had only just graduated from listening to more than just pop punk, and the main thing I liked and still like about The Misfits were Danzig's vocals and the melodies. And this album didn't really do that, it was kind of an outlier. But I failed to realize at the time, and what Glenn probably didn't consider is that Spot produced this album like a hardcore album, which is what he did for most of the albums he produced around that time. If Glenn didn't want that, then maybe he should have gotten someone else to produce it, or just produced it himself. And honestly, to me, this album reads like a 21 minute song. It's really hard to pick out individual songs because they're all like puzzle pieces. When you put them together, you get the big image of Earth AD. Or Earth AD Wolf's Blood. I never understood the name anything with this album. I mean, it only says Earth AD on the album cover, so I don't know. And speaking of Wolf's Blood, the half title track is maybe the most ferocious Glenn has ever been on record. Which makes sense, because this song is about the transformation of a man into a werewolf. Not that he could tell what Glenn is saying anyway without reading the lyrics. It just sounds like a rabid dog going mental. <laughs> That was Earth AD. It was a hell of an exclamation mark to end the original Misfits tenure, though it definitely isn't for everyone. It's probably the only time the Misfits were ever actually scary on record. It's a visceral experience, and for many, that's where the Misfits story ends, as they broke up two months before this album even released. But we are far from done here. As many of you know, Glenn would go on to bigger and arguably better things with Sam Hain and Danzig, and he became an icon in hard rock and metal. And don't worry, we'll discuss those bands, or at the very least Sam Hain, some other time. Though during the 12 years the band was not active, Glenn released some compilation albums, Legacy Brutality and Collection 1 and 2. And I am not a big fan of these releases. I liked them when I was getting into the band as they're pretty much best of compilations, but after listening to the original albums and EPs, I can't help but get annoyed at Glenn for pulling a George Lucas and fucking with the mixes and dubbing over guitars on like every track. They now sound too busy and a lot gets lost in translation. The guitars sound like shit now and most of the new mixes just aren't good. Even Ari Vaughn plays drums and bass on Collection too, and don't get me wrong, I love Ari Vaughn for what he did in Sam Hain and Danzig, but he was never in The Misfits. What were they thinking? Apparently Glenn did this so he wouldn't have to pay royalties to the other members, and if true, that's pretty goddamn shitty. Fuck you, Glenn. During this time, Jerry and Doyle worked full-time their dad's machine shop, but after Glenn wrote them off in interviews for years as untalented drug addicts, and after he got more and more into the occult and dark stuff with Sam Hain and Danzig, they formed the Christian metal band Christ the Conqueror as a sort of response to Glenn becoming a 4'5 Prince of Darkness. And Jerry pretentiously said that he hoped that the righteous message of Christ the Conqueror would help steer kids away from Satanism after hearing Danzig sing a song called Am I Demon. But it was mainly just a pet project. Though they released an EP called Deliver Us From Evil, and there's still an unreleased album of the same name that has since been leaked and uploaded to YouTube. They somehow got Jeff Scott Soda to sing on it, and Dave the Snake Sabo from Skid Row to play on it, and after hearing it, it's not bad. There's a lot of cool guitar work courtesy of Doyle, and a lot of these riffs would later be repurposed on the next couple of Misfits albums. Speaking of which, after years of legal battles, Jerry and Glenn finally reached an agreement that lets Jerry and Doyle use the Misfits name for performances and albums, but both of them shared their rights for merchandise. They got a new drummer named David Calabrese, who would later adopt the name Dr. Chud during the Christ the Conqueror days, and ended up being the drummer for the new Misfits of the 90s. Originally, Dave Vanian from the Dans was asked to join the band, but he never turned their calls. And they even tried to extend an olive branch to Glenn, and uh... uh did you ask Glenn again? Yes, we did. Let's end. Uh, he threw us out of his hotel. <laughs> <laughs> we took that as a no. But they eventually found a young man by the names of Michael Emmanuel, or Michael Graves as he would later be rechristened. And he had no idea who the Misfits were, but after being a copy of Collection 2 and or Walk Among Us depending on who you ask, 
He just got it, and the Misfits found their new frontman. I got a lot of people who are so bent on the old stuff that they won't even listen yeah. to the new stuff, and I feel bad for them because, you, you know, you really can't bring back the 70s or the 80s, and if you could, why would you? I mean, that's the really the, the, the thing that aggravates me is why would you do something? You weren't there. You don't know. Today, the scene is so much stronger and so much better, and... Um, you know, people, our kind of music is now an accepted thing. And as a result, I think that if you're still working along those lines, you can do a much better job. And I think American Psycho shows that. Oh boy, the Misfits without Danzig. If you're not on board, then by all means, you can leave, because overall, I do like 90s Misfits. I know, sacrilege. But you gotta consider my age. I wasn't there when the Misfits originally started riots in San Francisco in the early 80s. I didn't even start getting properly educated on punk rock and its history until high school. At which point I was already weaned onto the pop punk of Blink-182 and Green Day, so I had no issues accepting a Misfits without Glenn Danzig. But if I was at those shows in the 70s and 80s and saw the Misfits do what they do best, yeah, I might hate this shit too purely on principle, and as much as I enjoy the Graves albums, I still don't think they're as good as any of the Danzig albums, for reasons I will soon touch on. First off though, Michael Graves, the man himself, I really dig his voice and songwriting. As a frontman, I don't think he's too great, he doesn't own the stage anywhere near as well as Glenn could, but where it really matters, he kills it. And yes, I know he's added himself as a conservative punk. <laughs> And a proud boy in more recent years, with ties to the January 6th insurrection attempt. Sherry sure can pick him, can't he? But in the context of the Misfits, I don't care too much. You'd be hard pressed to find any politics in his era of the Misfits. Hell, Glenn was more political with Bullet, so my Bernie Sanders loving ass is unaffected when listening to these albums. I mean, Dig Up Her Bones is one of my first experiences with this band. I remember thinking, it may not be Danzig, but it's still really good. And Michael makes the band his own. It's not as irreverent as Danzig's Misfits could be, and Michael can't sell the spooky stuff as well, but this song and many others has its heart on its sleeve. It reminds me of Typo Negative. There's a tenderness to it under all the riffs and darkness. The lyrics are simple enough, a guy misses his girlfriend and wants to see her again, so he digs off her corpse. If Glenn wrote this song, then there would probably be some necrophilia involved somewhere. Graves' albums sound great thanks to Daniel Ray's production, the same guy who was responsible for the Ramones' late period bangers. These albums have a much more polished sound compared to the albums that preceded them. There's more of a metal influence with the riffs and song structures, but there's nothing wrong with that. Danzig did something similar with Samhain. He just did it better, truth be told. But American Psycho is still quite good, just not great. There's a handful of fantastic standout tracks here, don't get me wrong, especially the tracks where they go for a more original sound instead of aping the original era. I mean, there's even a song on this album called Walk Among Us. And yeah, you can tell they're going for a Walk Among Us vibe, that's for sure. They're aiming for an Astro Zombies or Skulls, but the end results sound more like a band who would appear in a Halloween episode of Yo Gabba Gabba. What was edgy and macabre in the 80s became quaint and goofy after movies like Scream came out. Though that's also due to Glenn Danzig singing material like this with just far more conviction. And songs like Walk Among Us, From Hell They Came, The Haunting, and Mars Attacks aren't bad songs. They're perfectly cromulent when listening to this album, but they don't leave an impression and I never go back to any of these tracks specifically. And it's a bit of a problem when a good portion of this album are made up of tracks like that. But we do occasionally get some more unique songs like Resurrection which has the same drum intro as Poison's Cry Tough. I'm not kidding. But I like it because it takes a more introspective approach to a Misfits song, which hasn't really been touched on since, fuck, hybrid moments. And like that song, it is criminally short. Come on guys, you could have at least stretched this to three minutes. We 
also get some heavier cuts with songs like The Hunger and Crimson Ghost, which are a lot of fun, and you can see the improvement Jerry and Doyle have made on their instruments. The riffs are still very simple, but it's incredibly precise and there's no sloppiness to be found like in the band's original era. There's also a lot of songs about movies and well-known franchises, and yeah, I know Danzig did this a lot too, but I don't know, it just feels a lot cheaper here. Like they're ticking horror flicks off a checklist to write songs about. Like, don't get me wrong, I love the title track. It's so stupid and edgy you can't help but enjoy it. And I'll give them props because it was based on the book since the movie had yet to come out yet, but American Psycho is such an intelligent work, and to see it reduced to lines like lines of cocaine cut in hell feels a little half-baked. But with that being said, my favorite track of this album is based on a film, the song Shining, not based on the Stanley Kubrick classic, but instead another classic, Toby Hooper's Poltergeist. I don't know about how well it represents the film, but it goes so hard. The drums are amazing, Dr. Chud proved that he was a great recruitment, the riffs are great, the song goes all over the place, and Michael shows off his gruff vocal, which I really enjoy. If you never cared for the Graves Era of the Misfits, and you're somehow still watching this video, I'd recommend giving the song a shot. Overall, American Psycho is a solid record from the horror punk originators, but it unfortunately falls flat at some points with some less than stellar songwriting cliches, but they had a great base to go further on later records. Geffen gave them the boots after this record because it didn't do Green Day numbers like they probably hoped. They released Evil Live 2, another live record, and it was okay. Though Michael Graves took a hiatus from the Misfits for about a month or two for personal squabbles he was having with the band. I took a hiatus because I, I was I was kicked out of the band, essentially. I, I found out that Mike Hideous was was taking my spot. And it, so it just it just didn't make any sense to me, and so essentially I was fired from the band. So during that time, they got a guy named Mike Hideous, and I thought he was really good in the bootlegs I've seen. He could sing all the material really well, he had great stage presence, and he looked badass. If Jerry was smart, which he clearly isn't, he should have gotten this guy back when they again found themselves without a singer a couple years later. But Michael soon rejoined the band, and they signed with Roadrunner Records to release their next album, Famous Monsters. For us, the Misfits never stopped. Uh, in 1983, we broke up and tried to put the band back together in 85, but we ran into legal problems, which took 13 years to solve. Well, a lot of the old bands that came back uh, came back for what I believe are all the wrong reasons. Uh, the punk revival was no more than a uh, commercial play to try and create some record sales and to bring back some old ideas. Uh, the new Misfits band is not about that. The new Misfits band is about a band of the future. Now, Famous Monsters is by far the best Misfits album post Danzig, so that means it's all down here from here, folks. The band really built up on the foundation they laid on American Psycho. They didn't really add much new, but they took what worked in that album and worked to improve it. Now, it's not really perfect as the problems with that last album still exist, but only to a certain extent. Those less than ideal elements have been vastly improved. The filler tracks are much better, there's less high right duds, and the songs based on movies feel much more fleshed out and less corny. They feel more at home with songs like Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Fly. Take for instance, Helena, based on the film Boxing Helena, which fun fact was directed by Dave Lynch's daughter. It's a demented song about hacking up a woman until she's a limbless specimen while pleading your love for her. It goes batshit insane by the end and it takes you on such a fun ride with a magnificent crescendo that goes all over the place. Doyle's riffs are bountiful, and Michael gives it his all with a frankly pained performance with an amazing scream at the climax. The big thing that people remember about Famous Monsters is the fact that there was a video directed by George A. Romero. For those of you who somehow don't know, he's the guy who practically invented the zombie movie as we know today with his dead series of films that started in 1968 with the original Night of the Living Dead. 
Day of the Dead is my personal favorite, in case you care to know. And he directed the video for the song Scream in return for the band appearing in his film Bruiser, which is not exactly a winner of a film, I'll say that much. But hey, it had the misfits in it, so it's not all bad. There was unfortunately some drama involving the filming of the video, with Michael not showing up, though explanations vary between camps for why this happened. Michael doesn't show up. We have to have an understudy put on the makeup and walk through the scene really quick. And it looks like, Michael, you wouldn't even know the difference. Again, Doyle was freaking out because nobody told us and we weren't going to get a ride. I don't know. So it was always all for one, one for all. Doyle, are you going to go? No, I'm not going. Forget those guys. Doyle and I were, were left behind. And so eventually I got a phone call from somebody saying, I guess it was from Doyle saying that he was on the way up there. Now, at this point, I was already I was already late. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't catch a plane. I couldn't even if I, I had left at that moment I would have been late for filming. Though the resulting video is fucking fantastic. With the band playing zombies terrorizing a hospital, the song itself also rips. It's so anthemic. It was written for the then upcoming Scream 2, and it should have been in that movie. It would have made that piece of shit so much better. The Scream series is the most overrated horror franchise ever. Fight me. Another one of my favorites is Saturday Nights, a deranged song of love and loneliness. It's structured like an old Beach Boys or Ron Nett song, but with a fuck ton of distortion and a doo-wop rock and roll vibe. You could easily snap your fingers to it. On the surface, it's about a guy who killed his girlfriend and comes to really miss her, but I've seen some people say that it's analogous to just a really bad breakup. And I like that idea, even if I'm not sure if I 100% agree. It comes back to what I was saying before. When Glenn was in The Misfits, he wasn't really into portraying the personal side of him. He did later in a lot of Danzig songs, but not The Misfits. He was more interested in writing songs about the fucked up and macabre. And there's nothing wrong with that, as I've already said, I prefer Danzig Misfits. But I love how Michael could bring a more human side to songs that may sound ridiculous on paper, but because he nails the delivery, nobody really cares. And songs like this became classic Misfits, whether Glenn likes it or not. This album's production sounds even better than American Psycho. Daniel Ray is still here, but so is Ed Stasium of Ramones, Talking Heads, Motorhead, and Soul Song fame. He co-produces, is mixing, and even plays some guitar on this album, and he's a fantastic addition to the fold. Though there's unfortunately some real clunkers on this album, including Witch Hunt, Scarecrow Man, Die Monster Die, and Hunting Humans. They just feel like they're treading on familiar territory and are pretty forgettable. But there's also some kind of out of the box songs, like the super fast and cutthroat Living Hell and Them, the mid-tempo but incredibly infectious Fiend Club, which I love despite its greasy mozzarella cheese, but it's so endearing. And Descending Angel is just a magnum opus of post-83 misfits. I don't think it's really horror-related. There's some creepy lines here or there, but I'm pretty sure that's in the contract whenever you write a misfit song. I think it's simply about losing someone with a backdrop of heaven and hell and all that. Once more, Graves is giving a more grander portrayal of a misfit song. The music itself is simply put, epic. The simple guitar riffs form a huge wall of sound that envelops the listener and it just elevates the vocals and lyrics. And that solo is so good. It may not be Van Halen, but it's just so perfect. The band really outdid themselves here. Overall, Famous Monsters is a flawed but fantastic album, even though it's kind of American Psycho over again, but I think it's better than American Psycho in literally every single way. It seemed like the new Misfits were really going somewhere. They were consistently getting better, and people started to take notice. Then everybody left except for Jerry. Yeah, it was pretty rough. Dr. Trudd and Graves walked off stage and quit at a show at the House of Blues in Orlando, Florida in 2000 and Doyle soon after left after Jerry started singing lead and hired a new guitar player without his permission. And you know what's bad? When your own brother doesn't want to be in a band with you anymore. 
Jerry really fumbled the ball here, what else can I say? And it's a real shame Jerry took over lead singing vocals, as for a little while they had a guy called Zoli sing for them, and listening to bootlegs I thought he was really good. And if not him they could have gotten Mike Hideous back and we wouldn't have had to hear Jerry's piss poor attempts at crooning. In 2001 a compilation called Cuts from the Crypt was released, which included a bunch of demos and some rarities with the 90s lineup, and such a shame because there's some really good songs on this album, like the riftastic No More Moments which again was them trying to do something cool and new for them. These songs could have easily been on a new Misfits album, but alas, it wasn't to be. I'm still waiting for you. But soon after everyone told Jerry to fuck off, he got Des Kadena from Black Flag on guitar, and Marky Ramon from, you guessed it, the Ramones on drums. And they decided it would be a really good idea to record an album of nothing but cover songs from the 1950s and 60s. And oh boy, fuck it, let's just rip off the band-aid. Bring on Project... Bring on Project 1950. Brand new CD's doing great. I mean, uh, it's fantastic. We got uh, Jimmy Destry playing keyboards from Blondie. We got Ronnie Spector singing on it. Uh, we talked to Debbie Harry. Hopefully, she'll do something for us. And, uh, you know, it's coming great. Marky did a great job. Cut 10 songs in eight hours, which I thought was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand that Donna and the Blitzkrieg Bob are the same chord progression. So, you know, number one hits don't only take three chords. <laughs> It's been a really long time since I've discussed a truly terrible album in a retrospective. And man, what a comeback to have with Project 1950 of all records. I remember Anthony Fantano years ago discussing why I review some albums as not good instead of a 0, 1, or 2 out of 10. And that's because sometimes a project is just a bad idea from the outset. For example, Machine Gun Kelly doing pop punk is not good because there's no way that can be anything other than dog shit. Nostalgia Critic trying and failing to parody the wall is the definition of awful. There's a similar precedent to members of the Misfits, Black Flag, and the Ramones covering classic rock and pop songs from the 50s and 60s. I'm not saying that Project 1950 is on par with Nostalgia Critic's The Wall or Machine Gun Kelly because Project 1950, it's, uh, it, it's at least shorter so I don't have to suffer as long. I mean, it's just a bad idea and it would take surgical precision to not fuck it up spectacularly. And they fucked it up spectacularly. And yes, I called this just members of Misfits, Black Flag, and the Ramones. This is not the Misfits. Yeah, you could say the same for the Graves albums, but at least Doyle was still there, and there was reverence for the band's legacy, and they retained enough of the band's classic sound to make it sound cohesive, but Project 1950 is like a lame supergroup that got together for one album before breaking up because nobody cared. But because Jerry had the rights to the name, they were apparently the Misfits. And nothing gets Des and Marky because their performances are fine, but it's just a bad idea, so it doesn't even matter. And Jerry, for fuck's sake, Jerry is just not a good singer. Live, his voice isn't too horrendous since no one expects an amazing vocal performance at a punk show, so he can kind of get away with it. But on record, it's a whole different story. He's got the most flat and monotonous baritone croon I've ever heard. He's got the range of a quadruple amputee turtle. And that's if he's even in key to begin with. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. And I guess to help, Jerry also got Ronnie Spector and Jimmy Destry of Blondie to guest on some tracks, but all it does is embarrass these musicians that Jerry threw under the bus by getting them to perform on this album. At the very least, Ronnie Spector could still sing really well, even though she was almost 60 at the time. So at least she can break apart Jerry's god-awful croon a little bit, but there's simply no fixing Jerry's croak. Before listening to this album again for the first time since I did the worst of best two years ago, I decided to listen to the original songs that were covered on this record. And while I can't say I loved every song, I at the very least liked most of them. And I can say for certain that Jerry didn't seem to understand what made most of these songs work to begin with. Like why try and make Donna by Richie Valens into a fast punk rock song? People liked that track because it was a slow moving song of love and heartbreak. But when you do this, the context of the lyrics are completely lost. And that's ignoring the dog shit vocal performance. And they did something similar with You Belong To Me. 
The original song works because of the spare instrumentation so Joe Stafford's beautiful voice can be the listener's focus, but because Jerry can't sing for shit, they need to drown out the track with a grotesque amount of distortion. And Jerry had the gall to cover Elvis Presley, even though evil Elvis had long since left the band. And people compared Glenn to Elvis because he had a comparable range and timbre to the king. But Jerry, I've seen fat Elvis impersonators do better than this. We can go on so that's Project 1950, one of the all-time worst releases in all punk rock. And I don't say that lightly. It has very few elements within it that can even be described as decent. There's nothing here worth listening to at all. In fact, a few weeks ago I was on my way to work and thought to myself, well, I need to listen to Project 1950 again soon for this video, even though it sucks. And even though I went in and expecting a bad time, I'm not lying, I couldn't get two tracks in before bowing out and just listening to Earth AD to get the taste of OK Boomer the album out of my mouth. Skip the fuck out of this album. It's not worth listening to, even for the meme or just to see how bad it is. It's by far the worst covers record I've ever heard. And that's saying something because I've heard both Skeletons and Danzig Sings Elvis. Afterwards, Mark here left the band for what I can only assume is pure embarrassment. He's since gone to record bashing Jerry, saying it was a farce and that he did it only because he felt bad for him. I don't know how much I can believe that though, he probably just wanted a paycheck. He was replaced by Robo for a few years, which was cool to see, even though by that point the band was just as much Black Flag as it was Misfits. But he left in 2010 and Eric Arce took his place. In 2006, an EP was released of two instrumental demos recorded during the American Psycho sessions, which is the definition of pointless. In 2009, they released a single for the song Land of the Dead, and two years later, to the behest of literally everyone, the Misfits released what is, as of right now, their final album. Uh, the Devil's Reign is our first album of new material in the last decade. Uh, probably our finest work to date. I think this is our best work, I think this is our best lineup, I think this, uh, uh, I think this is our finest hour. I think we'll be here when the smoke clears. Well, excuse me, princess. It's pouring down, it's come for you, the devil's rain. It's pouring down, it's come for you. Maybe one of the most reviled albums within the last 15 years or so in punk circles. To many, it was bad enough when Jerry resurrected the Misfits in the 90s, with Doyle and a singer who, unlike Jerry, is competent. Screw the Michael Graves era. Get it out of my face. The last time I checked my mail was about two days ago. The first thing I clicked on, it, it, it said, F you, I hope you die. But now with literally only Jerry and two other randos who barely even fit in with the band, this album was slaughtered by everyone when it was released. And I'm here to say that it isn't as bad as many people have said. It's a halfway tolerable experience. A very shaky 4 out of 10. It sounds pretty good production-wise, and Stasium returns, and he does well. The performances are good for the most part. Eric Arce is very similar to Robo and has a similar tenacity to his playing. Jerry's bass is good, and even his vocals have improved since Project 1950, though they're still not exactly great, but I guess I'll take what I can get. And Dez is probably the MVP of this album. His guitar playing is great, and he has some really good solos here and there, even though he just isn't as aggressive as Doyle, and his riffs just aren't quite on the same level, but he still carries himself commendably well. He even sings and writes on my two favorite tracks of this album, which should probably tell you something about Jerry's contributions. The closing track, Death Ray, is a ripping song that has this cool apocalyptic sound. It gives me Don't Open Till Doomsday vibes from American Psycho. And Jack the Ripper is almost speed metal. It has this badass riff and it's really catchy at points. It's a shame Des didn't sing more because I honestly prefer his voice over Jerry's. I say that as if it's unpopular, the guy sang on fucking six pack. But still, his songs on this record are pretty good. So I Besides that, I don't mind the title track, Vivid Red and Where Do They Go, but most of the tracks remind me of mediocre cuts off of American Psycho based on classic films. But they're just so much worse here. It's like your dad's playing an impromptu set of shitty songs they wrote at Halloween. Whereas the original Misfits worked so well because Danzig, the crazy bastard he is, believed a lot of what he sang about. The World by Montague Summers. This is great. There's lots of great world stories in here, all documented. All true. He can make fun of Glenn all you want, but you can't deny that the man means every word he says. For better or for worse. Hitler, hero, or abomination? Uh, depends on who you ask. Whereas this album is so painfully campy and non-threatening, 
It's kinda sad when you compare a song like Land of the Dead to Skulls. Not only is Skulls just a way better track, but Land of the Dead shares more in common with the Monster Mash than any of the band's classic material. Most of the songs just melt together in your head. They're incredibly forgettable and this album just goes on for too damn long. And Famous Monsters is only about 5 minutes shorter, but at least that album had a decent amount of variety so you didn't really feel the length as much. But this album used the same mid-tempo beat over and over again and it gets so boring. Even they must have been aware of this. Wake up. Wake up. Overall, The Devil's Reign is not too bad, but it's also just not worth your time at all, even if it, there's at least a few songs worth checking out. But I'd recommend just listening to these tracks separately and not this entire record. It's painfully mediocre, which is maybe even worse than being flat out bad. At least Project 1950 was memorable, I guess. <laughs> I'll give it that. In 2015, Des Kadena left the band due to his battling cancer, which was really lame since I liked his inclusion in The Misfits. I never had any problem with him. It was Jerry who made all the bad choices. Des just played guitar. And it was really sad that he got cancer. I hope he's doing better nowadays with it. In his place, Jerry got... Jerry. No, I'm not kidding. Jerry's son, Jerry Other and he was fine. He didn't have great stage presence, but he plays the material decently well and he looks pretty cool, but the poor bastard seems to be having the same hairline issues his dad's been having for years. They released a live album, some singles, and an EP, none of which are really worth the time to talk about, let alone listen to. The new material shares the same issues The Devil's Reign does, and most of the new releases don't even have Dez, so I have even less reason to care. But in 2016, the impossible happened. Jerry only, Doyle with Gang Von Frankenstein, and Glenn motherfucking Danzig reunited at Riot Fest to the shock and awe of many. What was supposed to be a tense legal meeting about the band turned into a full-blown reunion somehow. Which is so weird because Misfits reunions have been on the table many times over the years, but Jerry and Glenn would butt heads and it just never transpired. And I never expected it to happen. Without both those guys to talk about each other, I thought a Misfits reunion was nothing but a pipe dream. I'm not doing a reunion with him. Ever. <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. It was something that could never really occur. I mean, you know, the thing is, you got two different philosophies on life, and uh, something that, uh, you know, could have been entertained, but, you know, there's just too much ego and too much, too much, uh, you know, cor corporation talk involved, and I mean, we're not that, you know? But alas, here we are. With the help of AC Slade of Dope, Murder Dolls, and Joan Jen the Blackhearts on rhythm guitar, and Dave Lombardo of Slayer on drums, they have played sporadic dates at some huge venues and headlined festivals since 2016. I mean, Alice Cooper is opening for them soon, and they're sounding great. AC and Dave fit in really well, Jerry and Doyle are as good as ever, and Danzig also sounds really good considering his age and the fact that his voice is just simply not what it used to be. It's really cool to see, but on another hand, it's kind of lame because they're only playing a handful of shows each year, only in big markets in the US, and I think like one show in Mexico if I'm remembering correctly. And maybe I'm just greedy, but fuck guys, please do a world tour. You guys have no idea the amount of money I'm willing to spend if you guys come to Australia. I will willingly go to my bank account for a ticket and not even think twice about it. I mean, fuck, I'll just settle for a new record and a really great pro shot live release. Fuck maintain the legacy. I don't care if it blows. Both Glenn and Jerry have released their fair share of stinkers in their career, and as fun as Doyle's solo band can be, I'll be the first to tell you it's fucking caveman music. The Misfits' legacy at this point is indestructible. Doyle and Jerry seems to be into the idea of new music, but Glenn's seems to be the stick in the mud. Jerry told Rolling Stone in 2016 after the first couple reunion shows, I want it to continue. I know Doyle wants it to continue, I know Glenn wants it to continue, we just have to be big enough people to make it continue. And that's where we're at. Whatever it takes, we're going into our 40th anniversary, so the time couldn't be any more perfect. Eventually, Doyle's got to write a new album, I've got to write a new album, and Glenn's got to write a new album. So why don't we work together and make the greatest album ever? Now we've got different elements, we've got Doyle playing more of a metal kind of thing, we've got Dave, who we're trying to figure out what the fuck he's doing, and Glenn's got his own thing, and AC fills in good too. And I've got the whole band where it is today, so it's a matter of remolding and using all the different elements that I've got. It gets us a shame that we'll likely never get a new album, and the band will only play a show here or there when they want a paycheck, and Jerry, Doyle, and Danzig would rather just make solo albums at this point. But hey, we still got a fuck ton of great material out of this band while it lasted. They started a revolution that you still see going to this day with bands like Metallica, AFI, Michael McRomance, and Creeper, 
all while pumping out classic song after classic song. Hell, even the Grave stuff is better than it probably should have been. Even though you can argue it's not the Misfits, those records still had a lot of great material. And the Jerry Only on vocals era, it sure exists. But if nothing else, Jerry kept the band alive over the course of decades, and you can tell he was doing it for the right reasons. He has a lot of fun performing for the fans, despite the quality of the records he sang on. We've had this band for 45 years at this point, and if nothing else, they've nearly always been a fun time. Like a really great comfort horror flick that you love to watch whenever you feel like it. They carved a legacy of brutality in the stone of rock and roll, and we will continue to feel their influence for many years to come. Where's the bad kids in this show? Where's those kids that are scared of me? <laughs> Where's those kids that are scared? Is it the ah! <laughs> You guys want a, want a poster? I only eat bad kids. You guys look good. That's not going to work. <laughs> okay, one. That's one for me. Subscribe to Disco Pigments.